Okay, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to the Japan Archives, episode 54A. Now I'm saying A because that means we're going to be splitting this into maybe two. Well, no, it will at least be two episodes, maybe three, which would be our first three parter. But we will see because doing the research for this, well, I've already finished the research, but I feel that because it is Japan's first emperor we're going to talk about, they've created a very long narrative for him. As he is their first emperor, they wanted to give him this spectacular story about how he came to rule and how he tried to unify Japan. So there's a lot of stuff for this one. So maybe two episodes, maybe three. We'll see. Uh, we did disappear again for three weeks. But like you all know, I was moving house and I should have been able to record. But then obviously moving house. And as you know, Heather, in Japan, getting internet installed the day you move in is practically impossible it's not a thing so i've been without internet for a while but we have internet again Yay. we're back as usual that's enough about me how have you been these past three weeks heather oh well yeah oh is a uh, the past three weeks have been really interesting i'll say that i am okay feel, last week was especially that was a that was a difficult week. And so far, I'm I'm looking hopeful for the future. And we're going to leave it at that for right now. So I'm feeling a little more relieved, a little more lighthearted, a little bit more weight off my shoulders. At this point, you know, it's subject to change. We still have a lot of things going on. But there's, you know, possibly good news for, for vaccines, hopefully coming soon. So I'm I'm hoping that a safe and effective vaccine will do a lot to help. There's new treatments as well for the coronavirus. So optimistically, reservedly optimistic and good and good, <laughs> health-wise good. And it's fall. It's November. Oh my gosh. We, we haven't recorded in November yet. So it's our first, our first uh, really cold podcast because it's turned, it's turning chilly. It's getting, it's getting colder now. It sure is. But are we ready then to finally start our story of Japan's first emperor? I am definitely ready. I'm going to do my thing. I've asked you what you already know. Anything? Nothing? A little bit? The first emperor I know nothing about. I do know a little bit about the current emperor. And in fact, there was the next in line, the heir to the throne. They had that ceremony this past weekend, I believe. So the brother of the current emperor is now the next in line for the throne. So I know a little bit about current events, but I don't know anything about the first emperor. Not even his name. I don't. All right, then. So today we're going to talk about Emperor Jimu, or as he's called in Japan, Jimu Tenno. This might be a good question for you to try and guess the answer. Who do you think the first emperor is descended from? It wasn't it. It's, it was the first episode we had about the the start of the Shinto. So he he descended from the the wasn't the Shinto gods like um, Izunagi Izunami Izunagi. Oh, I wasn't expecting that answer, but I suppose technically <laughs> yes. So. The, the Royal House of Japan, well, they don't anymore after World War II. They had to, like, renounce their divine claims. But historically, they claim descent from the sun goddess, Amaterasu. And Amaterasu was a child of Izanami and Izanagi. So, yeah, you are correct in a way. Now, to be more specific, Amaterasu had a grandson called Nunigi. And she charged Ninigi with coming down to the earth so he could rule over it. And from Ninigi, his great-grandson is the person who would become the first emperor, Emperor Jimu. We will talk about Ninigi at some point, but he will fall into the Shinto storylines we're telling. So we'll get to him eventually. We've talked about his more heavenly origins, but if you do want to know who his parents were, his mother was known as Tamayori Hime. And she was a dragon from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And his father was someone called... I'm going to try the Japanese as best I can, so bear with me, people. His ja his father was someone called Ugaya Fukiaizu. And from the union of these two people, Jimu was the last of four sons that they had. And it probably should be noted about his parents that his mother... Tamayori was also the aunt of his father. So a little bit of incest going 
into the start of his origins. I'm trying to picture the family tree and hmm, keep going. Already complicated. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm glad you explained that because I was like, wait, his okay, I'm ready. Now, Emperor Jimu is. You could kind of say it's not his name, it's more of a posthumous name, which was given to him at a much later date. Traditionally, he was born with the name of Kamu Yamato Iware Biko, which based off of one translation I have come across, you could translate the name as something like Boulder Hamlet Lad of Sacred Yamato. This name is used in both the Kojiki and the Nihongi. The two old documents we talked about before, which are used to chronicle the origins of the emperors of Japan. Whereas both of those documents do agree, we do also find that in the Kojiki, at least, there are other names which were used for the emperor, these being Wakamike Nu, Toyomike Nu, as well as Hiko Hohodemi. So there's at least four names for this emperor in addition to the name we now use for him. In trying to tell this story, I'm trying to bring together both of these sources as in one book they talk about certain events, whereas in the other one they gloss over them or don't even mention them entirely. And I'm also going to be using another book that I have from 1959, which kind of attempts to bring all these points of storytelling together. According to the records, it said that he was a man of great intelligence and resolute will. And though he was not the firstborn son of his parents, like I said, he was the fourth and last, he was still chosen as the heir to his father. And so at the age of 15, it was decreed that he would take the throne. Emperor Jimu himself being born in 711 BC. So quite a long time ago. Was there any reason why he was chosen instead of his other brothers? Not that it's said in what I've read so far. Now, during his childhood, I suppose, he said to have met and married a woman from the province of Hyuga, and she was known as Ahira Suhime, and together the two of them are said to have had two sons, Prince Tagishimimi and Prince Kisumimi. This was at quite an early age for him, it said that this happened all at the age of 15. And then the records kind of jump a little. So we're jumping from the age of 15 to the ages of 45 for Emperor Jimu. And it's during this time that he started to think about bringing all of Japan under his rule and trying to unite all the people together, stating that at this time, the remote regions do not yet enjoy the blessing of imperial rule. And also saying that since their first heavenly answers first came down to earth, it had been one million. 792,470 years. So in my opinion, I think he was deciding it's probably about time that everything was united because it had been quite a while. When he was trying to decide how to go about uniting Japan, it said that he heard from the Ancient of the Sea. And this was a being known as Shuho Sutsu no Oji. And this ancient of the sea said that there was land to the east and so that is exactly what Jimu wanted to do. He decided he would move east and on his way there unite the people on his way. Right now we're on the island of Kyushu but the Ancient of the Sea told him about land to the east so basically he would be making his way to the mainland of Honshu. So essentially Japan kind of got its start on Kyushu. Yeah which always surprised me when I found this out. I always assumed Honshu is the biggest island, you would have think that the origins would have stemmed from there and slowly gone on to the smaller islands. But no, in fact, it starts from the island that is most west. Well, it does make sense because we did have the records, the rice coming from Kyushu as well. So to have the origins of, of, of kind of rice coming from there as well, that would actually tie in together. So the actual history kind of ties in with the mythology in a way. Mm. Like we know historically people came from the West, so the myths themselves followed the tradition. Possibly. That's interesting. Look into that. Possibly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, have, have you ever heard of a Google whack? Only if I'm doing a Google search and it gives me something really strange. So for me, a Google whack is when you Google something and Google literally says, I got nothing. Like it comes up with zero results, which is very rare. That is very rare. So, <laughs> and I tried to do this for the Ancient of the Sea. I was intrigued to see if there was any extra information about it because he was only, he or she, 
was only mentioned in the Nihongi and not the Kojiki. Mm. So I googled their name and yeah, we got a Google whack. So I'm kind of at a dead end for this ancient of the sea. It's kind of a mysterious thing. So if anyone does know anything, please let us know. Now they begin to travel east to begin this unification. And like I said, they were on the island of Kyushu. So they leave Kyushu and to move on to the other islands to try and complete Emperor Jimu's task. And they begin this in 667 BC. His brothers come with him. So his three brothers were called Itsuse, Inai, and Mike Irino. But we see that they actually didn't live Kyushu right away. They traveled from Hyuga province to the northeast of the island, where they then had a great feast that was thrown in their honor. I suppose you can't start a unification without a grand celebration, I suppose. The banquet was given by two people known as Usa Tsuhiko and Usa Tsuhime, and the Emperor Jimu at the time, decreeing that Utsa Tsuhime would be wed to one of his attendant ministers known as Ama no Tane. Historically or mythologically, the Nakatomi clan, which is which was quite a big clan in ancient Japan, claims descent from these two people. From there, they then move north, and so they're still on the island of Kyushu, and then they decided to stop and spend a whole year there. So I suppose their unification wasn't... They were in a hurry mm. to unify Japan at this point. After a year of relaxing on Kyushu, they finally do land on the main island of Honshu, in the province or district of Aki, which is in modern day Hiroshima prefecture. Here they then stayed for seven years, at this time dwelling inside a palace that they themselves built. Sadly, we don't know the exact location of where this palace is now, whether it actually did exist or whether it was added as part of this mythological story, we can't be sure. So whether we find it or not would remain a mystery. After these seven years of, I suppose, doing nothing because the, the chronicles that I've read don't detail any major events. They mm. literally say, and they went here for seven years. So it's been seven years. So it's been eight years now since they started and they haven't really done much. And they move eastwards to the land of Kibi, which now would straddle between Hiroshima and Okayama prefectures. And they stop again, this time for eight years, building another palace that they stay in for the whole time. So now it's been 16 years and they haven't really done much. As a quick aside, these 16 years, these are years that are detailed from the Kojiki. The Nihongi does give slightly different times, but I thought I'd just pick one for today's episode. So after this time, they decided to sail onwards, passing through what is now known as the Hoyo Straits, which separates Shikoku from Kyushu, and there we gain a new person for our story. As they're sailing through, they come across a fisherman who was fishing alongside a turtle in the ocean, and they asked him what his name was, but the stories don't really say that he told them their name, so they gave him a name, and the stories say that they called him Saone Tsuhiko, or if you read in the Nihongi, they called him Utsuhiko. Now this man revealed that he was actually a spirit of the earth and one who could generate wind and waves by flapping his robes. He agreed to serve and follow the Emperor Jimu and so they decided to pull him on board their ship. This spirit then decided to act as a guide for Emperor Jimu and then help them sail onwards back to Honshu. Sailing onwards, they stopped at an area next known as Shirakata no Tsu, which is located somewhere between modern day Osaka Bay and the Ikoma Mountains, where they then decided that they would rest for a while after all of the sailing they had just undertaken. And here it is that we see one of the first battles that the Emperor had to deal with at the time. So the Emperor, his brothers, and his people were attacked by someone called Nagasune Hiko from a place known as Tomi which is now in modern day Nara city. This man had marshaled his forces against the Emperor Jimu, stating that the object of the children of the heavenly deity is surely to rob me of my lands. And so, trying to protect himself and his land, he decided to attack the what would be later emperor. Now it's said that the battle 
was like quite fierce and the emperor's brother his brother itsuse was actually injured taking an arrow to his hand or if you're reading the nihongi he took the arrow to his elbow this arrow being shot from nagasune hiko himself itsuse was rather angered by this and he said that they could not continue to fight in this battle because of the position they were in as during this fight they were facing towards the sun so they couldn't really see their enemy because the sun was in their eyes he stated that as he and his brothers were descended from the sun goddess themselves they shouldn't have to fight facing the sun but instead the sun should be at their backs so they could have a better view of their enemy and so they could attack and so that's exactly what they did. They retreated, they managed to skirt their way around their enemy and attacking from the rear with the sun behind them, they managed to destroy this group of people. Sadly though, Emperor Jimu would lose his first brother. He then died of his hand wound, which seems rather excessive. Perhaps infection. I mean, I'm not sure the medical treatment back then was, I mean, the arrow itself could have been like Very contaminated true. he could have gotten dirt in his wound possibly infection so sometimes small things can bring a big person down i hate it when you're right but yes you are right i, well, I don't know if it's right so much as it's a, good, a conjecturing that yeah because of the area they were in at the time they then decided to bury his brother on mount kama so kamayama in the city of wakayama with that after the burial of his brother more sailing began after the battle but the seas and the winds decide to turn against them for a time jimu's two remaining brothers crying out in alarm at this fact his first brother inai cried out that as a descendant of the heavenly deities why are they harassing him both on land and by sea and so he decided to brandish his sword and jumped in the ocean to drown himself transforming himself into the spirit later known as sabimochi his other brother, Mike Irino, then cried out that his mother and aunt were both sea spirits. Why would they raise great bellows of waves against them? And so he decided to run away, treading on the waves of the ocean to go to the place known as Tokoyo, the Everworld, a place we have mentioned briefly before as a land full of immortal beings and golden orange orchards, the same place where cockerels were gathered from to try and coax Amaterasu out of the rock cave. So in essence the emperor had lost all his brothers now and he is alone with merely the other people who agreed to help him unite all of Japan. And so they travel onwards to the Key Peninsula. The Key Peninsula is close to Nara so mm -hmm. geographically we're kind of staying in the same area. Here we see a rather strange event at least according to the Kojiki. We'll get into the Nihongi version in a moment. In the Kojiki it says that when they were on land again, the Emperor Jimu, he saw a bear going in and out of the mountains and suddenly from the sight of it he just fell down and fainted. And all his men then did the same. In the Nihongi version there is no mention of a bear and it says that they all fainted due to poisonous vapors that were belched forth by the gods. And I assume from that reading that the gods it hints at would be gods dwelling upon the earth, which they need to subdue and unite, because it would seem strange for the spirits up in heaven, or Takamagahara, to put the Emperor Jimu in danger as he is one of their descendants. The, the, the bear theory, though, seems rather strange because there's quite a few bears in Japan, and I would imagine they would have seen a bear before this period of time not sure but very two very different uh ideas so this has happened jimu has fainted all his men have fainted and in theory that would put them at risk like there's no one there to protect them anymore but luckily the stories do say that they were saved by a man known as takakuraji who came to the place where he and all of his men had fallen he brought with him a broadsword um, which he offered up, the broadsword being sharp enough to cut through anything in one go. And by offering up this broadsword in the presence of the emperor, he and all his men then woke up. And the blade in question was, I found the name for it, it was known as Saji Futsu. 
The Emperor, startled by suddenly being woken up after his fainting, he took the sword in his hand and swiping it through the air, it said that the, the evil and unruly spirits in the area were then cut down because from the notes I was reading in some of the footnotes of the book, it said that the sound that a sword makes as it swung through the air is enough to subdue and kill evil spirits. Mm. And so the Emperor turned to Takakuraji and he asked him, where did this sword come from? How did you get it and how did you save me? And so the man told him his tale. He said that he had had a dream in which he saw some of the spirits of heaven. He saw namely Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and her husband together talking to the deity known as Take Mikazuchi, who was one of the children of the fire god Kagusuchi, who we've previously talked about. So they were talking to this deity who was the son of the god of fire. And they were saying that he needed to go down to the earth to help their child, to help the Emperor Jimu. They could sense that things were not safe for him at the moment down upon the earth. And as this spirit had already once made the land below pledge submission to him and others, they said, you should go down and remind them of the fact that they agreed to be submissive. So why are they not doing it now? In reply which I found quite funny, he turns around and just goes, nah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going, I don't want to do it. But he did offer a different solution in that he had a sword, which he knew that if it was shown to the spirits of the area, they would subdue to the sword, in a way acting as a proxy in his stead. And so... In the dream of this old man, the gods then turned to him and said, when you wake up in the morning, you will find this sword waiting for you. You will find this sword waiting for you in his storehouse. And then after this, he immediately wakes up. He goes to his storehouse and then finds the sword waiting for him. And knowing what he needs to do, he then takes it to the Emperor Jimu and his men and successfully wakes them up again before they are attacked and killed by the evil deities of the area. And that's kind of where I want to leave it today. But what do you think so far of the story? Well, it's a very it's a very long tale with a massive stretch mm. of time. And I was I was doing a little bit of mental calculations. So you said about sixteen years had passed um, at one point, and he started the journey at forty five. Yeah. So he was in his sixties. So I guess his brothers were perhaps older. It had to be older than him. So his some of his brothers traveling maybe could have been, you know, perhaps around like 70 mm -hmm. makes a, although it does make the, um, the elbow injury definitely more believable that he died from an elbow injury if he's in of advanced of, of a little bit uh, closer to 70 years old, perhaps that could have definitely failed him as well as infection. So interesting story. And, and it touches a lot, a lot more geography than I, thought that they would encounter i thought it would kind of stay kind of the one area but going all the way up to like to nada that's quite a huge um huge huge expanse of land yeah well it's like you said it's interesting that it didn't start on the mainland hmm. yeah that was really that's really interesting but it does make sense and i i, I know there's some uh, quite a few historical areas on so i've been, I've been western japan so the in Kyushu and Hiroshima and like Osaka, that area does have a lot of, you know, the older capitals in Osaka. True. So that, it does make sense for them to go ahead and touch all of that point of land. I just thought it just was a little quicker than I thought would happen. And not quite as much mythology as I, I would have expected. I would have expected a little bit more mythology, but this is very, I, I guess after, um, after the start of Shinto, I was expecting a little bit more interesting things to happen but very kind of epic an epic sort of tale yeah i have found that when as soon as you hit the first emperor of japan there are certain elements of like mythological things like they are still talking to the gods they are technically meeting gods they met the spirit that that deity in the ocean who decided he would act as their guide but it is very much that they're taking a step back from the divine and trying to slowly phase it out it mm -hmm. seems till it's more just this is the human realm 
that we've united mm. we're now separate from takamagahara or heaven mm. and we will come back to it again there will be other mentionings of gods and things and even in later reigns of the emperors there are like prophetic dreams or gods come to visit but definitely as you get further on in time it does happen less and less it's really interesting i'm glad that you you've started this now and not earlier because to build on everything that you, you touched for the starting with the shinto was a, a really good starting place to give us some background to getting to this yeah i think if we'd have done this now and we'd have been mentioning these gods we would have had to like stop and have a good like a big segue or a big and a big aside to explain who these were but mm. now we have the base knowledge to draw upon because mm. i made that mistake when i first started researching japanese history i started with the emperors and then it talks about all these people and i i didn't know who they were and and now we we definitely know awesome this is this is really great and really informative and I'm looking forward to the next segment to see where, where we're going to go from there. And we're going to touch on, you said we're going to touch on most of the, the emperors of Japan. I think you said. So we'll have slowly over time. Yeah. So we'll come back to it and we'll do emperor number two, number three, number four and work our way through. Mm -hmm. We'll revisit certain events we've already talked about. For instance, we've already done the sacred Galia, which links to several different emperors. So we can come back to those and, expand upon them and things hmm. so i'm looking i'm looking forward to it like i've, I've said this before and i'll i know i'm going to say this again because I, I constantly do but to have a country with such a long history to be able to go back so far and to learn about i mean because america is not that old of a country we can go back it doesn't take too long to go through american history really compared to you know like japan and england and other countries so mm. to see this especially going back to like 660s 615 711 oh ooh, they began in 667 bc that's right it's bc i was like wait a minute it's, oh my god this is even this is bc period oh that's why did that just, seriously i don't know if it's like because it's late at night or or what but just or i'm so used to more you know shorter history to say oh my gosh that's bc that's not 80 that's even more that's even more incredible to me it's still kind of almost unfathomable unfathomable to have that long history mm, exactly well thank you so much for all that's a lot of research you had to do that's a lot of research that's just the tip of the iceberg we got to finish it next week but anyway we're getting very sidetracked here it is time for your section heather i offer you two choices i have i do have a story about bears and um, I, I can go straight into the, the poem, but the, the thing about the bears. So ap apparently uh, in Japan, because there is a lot of, of depopulation, especially in the like more rural areas or the mountain areas of Japan, people are flocking more towards the cities and a lot of people head towards like the major cities like Tokyo and Osaka. Well, apparently because there is uh, not quite as much population in the mountains, the bears who would kind of hang out the top of mountains or the, you know where people were living out in the mountains and forage for food, those sources have started to dry up. So now bears are coming more down into the kind of more suburban, heading toward the city areas. And that's a, a minor problem right now. Bears going through people's trash if they have it outside, which is not so common in Japan, but you know, you do have the trash trash stations that you know, get picked up at least twice a week. So bears are becoming a little bit more of a problem in certain parts of Japan. Interesting. Hmm. So there's your, your bear story. <laughs> I kind of wish you had a poem about bears now. Well, hey, we might get lucky because today we're going to be doing a sin view. And like the episode we did last time, I'm going to have you pick the poem today. So maybe we'll get lucky. I think there's I think there's animals in here. Let's uh, gamble that you don't pick the same one because um, I forgot which number, what page number it was. And please, if you would be so kind as to pick a number between 59 and 230. 111. Excellent. So pick one, two, or three. Two. I do have a name for this one. The 
author is Choroku. So Choroku, I'm not familiar with them. All right, so if you are ready, I'm going to take a practice run here. You take your practice run, I'll use that time to listen intently. Kuchidome o shite ototo o iko nishi. So, Thomas, what were you able to hear from that? Did you start by saying mouth, like kuchi? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's the kanji as well. And then I also heard ototo, yes. which is like younger brother. Uh huh. So, something to do with the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, apart from the kuchi and the ototo, I'm not too sure today. How about iko? As in like iku. Mm. So ko. Iko. Child. Ko ah. is child. Yeah, good. Like good. Good child. Iko desu. Oh, like i tenki. Iko. Hai. I desu. Iko. So the a mouth, a little brother. So the little brother is a good child. Well, I'll read you the translation. Let you let you determine what you think from that. Closing the younger brother's mouth makes him a good boy. Makes me feel that there's an older sibling who knows that if the if his younger brothers say something, he's gonna get in trouble. So he's like, let's just shh, shh, let's just not let's just be quiet, or you might get into trouble, or we both might get into trouble. Yeah, you're you're right. It feels like it's a poem where they're trying to save themselves from being reprimanded. That is so that the translation notes I have is. A girl was talking with her lover when her younger brother came along by chance and found them. You won't say anything about this to anyone, will you? You are a very good boy, aren't you? Oh, what a good boy you are. The parent would not be happy. No. And I don't know when this one was, was written, but I do know that the parents had to get approval. For, if you Basically, if you didn't get approval from your parents, it was your, the marriage is probably not going to happen. Or if it happened, you were essentially eloping and like parents were the determiner of who you were going to marry so right. if this was someone that the parents would not approve of yeah she could have gotten really 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 big trouble for that and considering this book was written you know the, the turn of the century yeah she would have she would have gotten in trouble so kind of somehow convincing her brother to please don't please don't rat on me or please don't tell on me I like that one, but well, we've said it before. Senryu is designed more as a humorous type of poem, and you can definitely kind of see why that would be humorous to someone. But also, it could be taken more as a more serious poem in a way. It's like, please don't get me into trouble. I think that's that's the the thing I I really do enjoy about Senryu so much is that we get to get to see some of the the life of like everyone and some of the, the cultural things that, you know, we, we do touch on some of them in our, our research, but, you know, the more, I guess, common person, the person of just the everyday simple life, you don't always touch on that. And you end up getting a, a lot of history from these because like the historical context, I mean, for example, like this, like realizing that in Japan, like the parents were the ultimate deciders and the choosers for your marriage, having these kind of things, like you were able to study history from them. So they, they're more lighthearted, they might be seen kind of not as, you know, highbrow or intellectual, but they give you a glimpse into, into the past that is yeah. really amazing now. And um, with that being said... I think for now that we will take a, a short break from Sinyu and next week we'll have something a little bit different, but I do want to come back to these again. But I think it's like you said, I think like with uh, the Shinto and now the emperors, like coming back to it every once in a while, like trying to do the Yakunin Ishin issue. Yeah. So let's say bye to Sinyu. My now. challenge to you then Ooh. is... We've done poems where we've come back to the same person. Your challenge is to find a poem by a person we haven't done yet. A new person. Oh, okay. I. That's not in the 100 Poems book. <laughs> okay, you can also add that to the challenge. I'm adding the next level up. Because I'm like, oh, that's easy. Which, who haven't we done yet? <laughs> so. <laughs>
I like that. Well, thank you very much for the poem. You're very welcome. Thank you for your participation in that. I, I, I like it so much better you choosing it than me because I go, oh, this one. Oh, no, this one. Oh, this one. And it's just, mm, it's so much more fun mm -hmm. this way with this in you. <laughs> I guess there's no real need to say what we'll be doing next week because it will be part B of our Emperor Jimu episodes. We should probably sign out then. If you want to find the show notes, which... Now I have internet. I can do the show notes again, Heather. It's so exciting to get the website back on track. If you want to see the show notes, you can check those out over at japanarchivespodcast.com. If you want to see some of the places I've seen while I've explored Japan, you can follow my Instagram, which is nexus underscore travels, N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. And you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Japan Archives. We're not always too active on those websites. <laughs> um, face, if you do want to follow them, Facebook will always be more of posting links to our show notes, whereas Twitter might be other things. I do have a few ideas where I want to do something different every day, like a Monday poem, a Tuesday folklore creature something like that a different thing every day i just need to start doing that now that i have internet again um but apart from that that is everything for me what about you heather you no know, i think that's a really good point to stop i'm good for me i'm good for me too okay then well until next week then guys thanks for tuning in matane <laughs>